have only one thought rattling in my head after finishing Hogwarts Legacy. It was fun, but it feels unfinished. Unlike many games that feel rushed, Hogwarts Legacy feels slightly different. There's something else wrong. It feels like someone was writing a story in class and their teacher told them to finish quickly, so they hastily wrote something down. After a few initial patches, there are very few glitches as well. The game runs well on most systems, and nothing is specifically or spectacularly broken. That is, if you aren't pushing your computer to its limits. Here are my computer specs, and you should know that for 90% of the game, I was running it on ultra settings, except on entirely random points, I would walk up some stairs or run through Augsmead and it would crash, which I know why it happened, and we will be covering it later, but first, let's focus on... Look at this, this is the Black Lake. Do you see that dragon? Yeah. Those guys fly through here at random points in the game. See this? This is Hogwarts Castle. This is where some random monsters are. Here we have just the dark forest and a multitude of evil creatures in here. These are spiders. These are humans. These are trolls. This is a dog bog. This is me flying through the night sky. Here we have some random characters and NPCs just moving through the castle. This is my favorite spot, which does look to be too far away from the castle, but it still looks amazing, okay? The world of Hogwarts Legacy looks amazing. It just simply looks amazing. There's no other way of putting it. And every single part of it makes you feel like a student attending this magical world and seeing things for the first time. The nights are filled with creepy sounds, dark corners, <laughs> random creatures flying away, and anything else that could possibly be imagined. The day is full of NPCs going about their business, doing magic, and overall, just living their lives. There are events that happen without you, or seemingly with you. This world makes you feel like a wizard or a witch. There are things magical that you can experience that before could only vaguely be explained in books. You can influence things, limitedly, that can only be done because you are magical. Creatures that are unbelievable, bits of trivia that is rare and unique, clothes that make you legitimately look magical. All this combined means that you are transported from the first moment you launched the game until you finish the main story into a world that completely consumes you. Hogwarts Legacy looks and feels amazing and it genuinely makes me wish there was more to play, just more to see. Left click and you shoot a basic shot of red magicry. Press and hold Q to cast Protego, the shield spell. Time your Protego perfectly and you automatically counter with Stupefy, which stuns most enemies for a few seconds. Your chosen set of spells appear in slots 1 through 4. You can use the mouse scroll up or down to change which 4 spells you have. Press T to sort through your small library of spells and fit them how you need them. Use Z to throw random objects with ancient magic, or press X to cast one of a random set of spells that usually destroys an enemy entirely, or takes a massive chunk out of their health. Out of combat, you can press R to cast Revealio, which reveals key items, hidden chests, or help with quests. Press V to reveal your current quest, hold V to get a quick guide to your objective. I have no idea what it is like on console, so for that, here is Big Mac Daddy. Go check out his YouTube, please explain to them. BMD. Greetings Mr. Sock Puppet and all you Sock Puppies. I have no idea what you call your subscribers but I think Sock Puppies might be here to stay. So I have been duly asked to educate all of you on the lovely controls guide for the controller for Hogwarts Legacy. Now obviously I have a PS5 controller here but it's the exact same control scheme for an Xbox controller just this being Y b a and x so no real biggie but you'll get the gist of it so we'll start um on this side why not so um this is the interact button the square button it's basically like what you interact with the world but use anything like that uh triangle was actually your protego or your block and stupefy button if you tap or hold it and i think also it also does that whole stupefy thing i think if you perfect parry with protego so triangle was quite important or if you were more evasive, you'd use circle, which is the dodge roll to get out of harm's way. Uh, X is to perform jump, so that's basically just to, well, jump. <laughs> um, then we move over to this side for the directional buttons. Now, this is the left one. So this is to access all of your spells that you had unlocked at the time. Um, if you wanted to also just take a look at like what you have. Uh, this one is Revelio, which obviously reveals secrets and information stuff about the world and obviously all those pages. 
Uh, you can heal with the bottom of the D-pad one, which is similar in, I think, quite a lot of the RPG Souls-like games also, anyway. Uh, this is the compass, or, like, if you, I think it's the one that, like, it literally has that, like, page fly in front of you to show you the way you need to go towards your waypoint. Then, uh, we look at the triggers. Uh, the front ones here are L1 and R1. So, if you tap both of them together, it's the ancient magic spell if you had, uh, one stored. R1 would just be the ancient magic throw, and if you tap L1 or hold it, it's to use the tool wheel. So that'll be like those snappy cabbages, cabbage chomping things, and um, basically all of your herbology stuff and some other um, potions that you made, like the Edgerus potion and all that. Um, and then the back triggers, these ones, this is to do your basic cast, that's if you just were doing like the normal casting and stuff like that, to, if you were like hitting stuff. Um, and if you hold it, it would activate a spell set. This one is for aiming, obviously, as is normal for a lot of games out there. Um, but also, R2 would be very useful if it comes to your casting, because to cast the actual spells that you have equipped, you will be using this paired with the right trigger. So you're holding down the right trigger, and depending on the button that you push with it, that's the spell that's binded, basically, to a thing. And if you hold it down as well and tap one of these, you'd also select a different spell set that you have stored. And finally, the two central buttons, obviously move and look around. Uh, the touchpad is to access your map. And finally, the little options button here is to open up your field guide. And if I have to hear Professor Weasley talk about that field guide one more time, I'm going to lose it. So, I hope this was a quick and fun educational guide for how to use the control in Hogwarts Legacy. Now back over to the main man, Mr. Sock. What is hardcore SSF? All of these are chunky at first, but after a while they become second nature. You cast spells at increasing speed as you move through the game, able to balance enemies you are focused on and enemies that can hurt you. Simply put, the gameplay of Hogwarts Legacy during fighting is surprisingly smooth and easy to comprehend, with color-coded spells telling you exactly what you need and when you need them. Combat in this game was extremely easy in the end, but still surprisingly fun to do. With the combat stuff out of the way, we do need to talk about a few of the things that weren't so good. There are things that started to grind on the nerves after the first 10 hours. Things like looking for a clue when Revelio can't reveal it, which is probably the most impossibly annoying thing on earth. More than once I read through a walkthrough just for some quick help in where I needed to go. The movement of the character can be stumpy too. What do I mean by that? You'll get stuck on a rock in one scene and then walk over an entire boulder like it's not even there just two meters later. Crouching and going under some things is an action that should be avoided at all times. Or really, really. One of the first skills I recommend getting is Swift, the talent that turns your normal dodge on control into a mini apparate similar to that of Blink from the Dishonored games. Yes, you can actually just use Swift through most of the areas where you have to crawl. This will save on your sanity, especially if you are in a with one of the companions and they are staring at a wall while you have to solve the problem of getting through the wall. Other than the crawling issue, movement in the game is relatively painless, except for cloaks. These do look amazing, but they get stuck. Cloaks, get off my flipping leg! Where were we? Right, gameplay. Conversations are relatively quick and can be sped up with the skip button, right click on PC, and gives you the option to learn more about everything through dialogue. Flying your broom is swift, if a little boring after a while, Yes, I can soar across the trees above it all. But also, it feels like I reached the top speed within two seconds of getting on the broom and then it just becomes staying close enough to the ground to not lose permanent boost. Hippogriffs are, how do I say this, obsolete about 20 minutes after you get them. They look cool, yes. But I do feel the only reason they were even in the game is because Harry flies on one in the third book and movie. For me, it felt surprisingly clunky and rather boring to fly on one of these. The Grafonder. That thing rides like a tank and feels like a tank. You get it at the end, so um, spoilers. But seriously, it is the only beast mount that I still just got on for the fun of it when I reach the 30th hour of playing the game. Once you have it, you'll understand. But I mean, just, just look at this thing. Just listen to it. But those are all the mounts, not including the freaking Thestral you get when pre-ordering the Deluxe Edition. The only failure that really started happening were some of the scripted fight scenes. The parts where I had to react to specific things and cast specific spells that weren't in line with the rest of the game's fighting stuff. I won't say when and where this happens, but switching from being creative with my spells to being railroaded did give me quite a rebound. Also, someone please tell me what the point of the Demiguise mission was. I at least thought the locks would be automatically unlocked once I collected them all.
You know what Harry Potter never truly was? It was never predictable. No one in their right mind would have thought that Quirrell was really a bad guy in book one. No one in their right mind would have thought Ginny was drawing blood letters on the wall in book two. And unless you read everything, you would not have known that Harry was the last Horcrux, the number eight that Voldemort never planned for. I really, really wish I could say the same about the story on Hogwarts Legacy. For all the things the graphics did right, and for all the things the gameplay does right, the story feels very bland at times, with very cookie cutter plot points. Something that leaks into even the companions. We'll touch on that next. But the main story of Hogwarts Legacy is basically, spoilers by the way, you can see ancient magic. Even Goblin wants all stores of ancient magic. Big super duper ancient magic is stored beneath Hogwarts. Final battle between you and Evil Goblin happens beneath the school. I could have predicted that. I did. I think I did predict that within my first 20, 30 minutes of playing the game and starting to grasp the story. Now, yes, there are some betrayals along the way. There are new revelations. There are things I didn't guess before it happened, but none of it felt unique and new. It all felt like a story planned out by a group of executives around the table going, so we need a story. Yes, we'll do this one. Smith, make it so. And you can just imagine Smith being the only writer of the group going, but I have this amazing plan. The protagonist needs to choose between using the ancient magic for good or evil. It would change the entire world. But obviously that all got cut out. At which point, poor Smith was told to keep their stupid ideas to themselves and the executives piece by piece removed all the complicated parts from the main story. As far as I can tell, even the darkest wizard playthroughs only dark wizards or witches because they choose to use the three same old unforgivable curses. Now, I do understand that at the end of the game, you can choose between two different things. And obviously I chose the good choice, but I did go and read up and I did actually watch a few playthroughs of a supposed bad wizard. And all I could think of was there seems to be no actual effects afterwards. Usually in an RPG, when you make that bad decision, there are repercussions afterwards instead of just one person dying. That is all that happens. That's the only difference between a good wizard and a bad wizard. You are role playing in this game, but you are role playing as a character that defeats the big bad evil no matter what goes on to do the same things no matter what. Even if you choose all the evil dialogues, you can never join the enemy army. You can never replace them and while NPCs will look at you with concern, there are no in-game benefits to actually being evil. Yeah, you absorb the repository, but your power levels after finishing the game stays the exact same as before. So, you know, the narrative is written in stone. It's just the finer details of that narrative that changes with your options. This is something that I find overall boring, considering this is an RPG set in the world of Hogwarts. Now, I must add in, there are some side quests that are surprisingly fun, or just completely random. These feel like the writers and developers of Hogwarts Legacy had a chance to do what they wanted, unbothered by a committee that dictated their choices. The one that comes to mind the most for me was a simple investigation of why Hamlet suddenly got overrun by spiders. Only to have things from notes that I read 10 hours ago connecting. Oh. Oh, this is the Hamlet with those people left. Oh, this girl I'm looking for is... Is she in case of spiderwebs? Wait, sh she has a basement? What's, what's in there? Ho. Oh. Oh. Ho. Holy crap, on a cracker. She was breeding acromantulas. And they're on me, I can feel it, I swear. Yeah, that quest sticks with me for several different reasons, but it was amazing to have all those little things connecting because it feels like the creators of the game weren't limited in the same way the main story of the game was. My final thought is that even after finishing the game and apparently defeating the entire Goblin Rebellion and Poachers, there are somehow still enough of them around to reappear even when all of them should definitely be gone. I know it's pedantic, but just once I would like to 100% the game. And know that unless I go to the spiders, there are very few if no actual enemies left. Though that is not a story thing, that is just me being pedantic. Listen, when I was first sold on this game, they promised me one thing. Companions that explore the world around me. One from each house, in fact. They would be there. They would be active. They would help me fight the bloody enemies. But the reality of it is different. Hogwarts Legacy does have companions. Three, in fact because hell knows everyone else is just set dressing. Let's just say this now, the voice acting is quite well done. These are indeed humans talking to us right now. They have emotions, and their emotions often make me want to punch them in the face with a stupefy. Sure First, the companion I found the most average, or me, or yeah, she is there, but if I knew her in the real world, I'd probably not want to know her. Latsai Onai. This girl, this girl is weird. I get her motivation, which I won't reveal, but her goal is to get rid of hollow screw of thugs that are bullying 
all of Hogsmeade, which confuses me. Not that they're trying to stop them, they're then trying to terrify all of Hogsmeade and the surrounding valleys. Everything we do with Nutsai is focused towards getting rid of Harlow. Thwarting his plans and helping those who have been wrong, Officer Singer is the main focus of who we report things to, but she doesn't seem to be doing anything. In fact, each time we do a mission with Nutsai and I, we get concrete proof that Harlow has been either kidnapping people, killing them, or just running the poacher scene in the background. Each time we take it to Officer Singer, she only ever tells Nutsai's, Mom? Wait, what? Wait, I know. I know. <laughs> Officer Singer is this user's because she is actually in cahoots with Harlow. Uh, no. In fact, it's it's nothing that big. For some reason, the village filled with witches, wizards, goblins, and other magical people and creatures are being terrorized by a band of like 10 thugs. 10 thugs that aren't even all that good with magic. Not only that, Natsai's efforts to do something seems to only be worth about nothing. And at any point, her telling Officer Singer, who is supposed to be competent, that hey, we know where their hideout is and they have a man trapped in there right now, it would have solved things. But instead, we are left to do all the dirty work and at the very end of the day, Natsai does very little apart from being in the way. The entire quest line for Natsai Ono felt like we were doing a lot of work for very little results, with the main villain of this quest line being, nah, I can't reveal what happened to him either, spoils for a main plot again. But yeah, Natsai's quest line felt empty to me, like it wasn't worth anything in the end. Next, we're talking about Sebastian Salo. If you have played Hogwarts Legacy, your overall opinion on this fellow will be the same as mine. I have never in my life wanted to join a virtual world more, just to punch one kid in the face, like I did during his quest lines. This is that guy you hear about in the family that seemingly only makes the wrong choice, and at no point does he ever think he is in the wrong. Even when he is alone in a room and he just cut off his own hand, would he still find a way to blame someone else? Truly, the worst character to have ever existed in the Harry Potter world. I have heard of players that had an evil playthrough and still could not stand the sight of this boy. Yes, he is a boy. Out of every character we meet, Sebastian Sado is the only one that behaves like a literal child. Not even the second year I met in the Ravenclaw common room was as dumb as he was. Okay, okay, I've said enough bad. The problem with Sebastian's entire questline is that it is set in stone in a way that makes it frustrating to handle him in any way. No matter how much you help him, he does the wrong thing which makes it very difficult to complete his quests. What is even worse, since he is the token Slytherin, he is naturally the token friend that knows the forbidden curses, because you know, Slytherin, they're all so evil. Yeah, I found the entire questline quite shallow. Shallow? Shallow. Anyway, you cannot talk about his questline either, since it only ends after the main plot of the game ends, which means that at many points just revealing why you are doing something with him would spoil the game's overall plot in a way that is irredeemable for people watching. Just know that at every point he could have chosen to try something different, yet he became obsessed with choosing the worst options. Bit of advice, if the thing you are using requires a living sacrifice, the thing you have is absolutely evil. Poppy Sweeting. The third and final actual companion. Poppy is a Hufflepuff fifth year and is the only companion whose quests I looked forward to completing. Like the other companions, her quests help to progress some parts of the main story. Unlike the other two companions, what we do during these quests are effective, fun, interesting, and overall, not completely brain dead. It might have to do with Poppy being willing to tell adults, even if there are centaurs, about the quests we are doing. Or it might have to do with the fact that the quests focus mainly on saving magical beasts of all kinds, making it feel immediately more rewarding. Poppy also seems to have more of a personality beyond just completing the quests. No kidding? Near the end of Natsai and Sebastian's quest, I honestly did not care about their tragic backstories anymore. I just wanted things to end so I can go back to enjoying the rest of the game. With Poppy it was, oh yeah, this is my tragic backstory which you probably guessed yes we did anyway i know where phoenix is we must save it and as you can imagine this made for an overall much more enjoyable story when playing alongside it what is poppy main's quest stop the poachers that is it those three words encompass everything we do with poppy each new quest digs us deeper into the trenches of what stopping the poachers with poppy means but the result is surprisingly still the same i never found myself disagreeing with poppy's choices nor did i sit back and go save you absolute baboonish oaf of a useless Slytherin. Not that I ever go, fudge sakes Natsai, just tell someone where the hell we are going. All of this of course is made null and void when you realize one very important thing. It is only during their quest that these companions will accompany you to do things. Every other time you will be roving around the world 
alone. Fighting trolls alone, which is shockingly boring when you really wish a companion would accompany you to simply have a bit of conversation. These are the three companions. I really wish I could reveal much more about them and their histories, but we'll leave those to a much more spoiler rich review. Just if someone make a mod for slapping Sebastian, please. With all of this being said, I feel safe in answering this question. Yes, you should be playing this game, especially if you are a Harry Potter nutter. If you grew up with the books and the movies, then this game is exactly what you wanted. Instead of forcing you to live the Harry Potter story, you get to live your very own story in the world that has been created already. There are some hurdles and some things that could have been done better, but overall, you will have an immense amount of fun in a game that has tens of hours of fun. I have no idea what the second game can even be about, but I'm really hoping that Portkey Games and Avalanche Studios will be able to get much more freedom and to get even more budget. Seriously, another game like this, but larger, more complex, and most importantly, more complete will be amazing. I've spent over 60 hours in the game now. I have every single achievement on Steam and I still want to start another run just to experience it all again. Uh, I have no idea if anyone of any note will see this video, but I seriously hope that they take some of the... Uh, wait. Yeah. I just complain. Um, ignore me, continue on with your lives and go do something amazing with it. Hello guys, as you can see this is the outro, so I hope you had a fantastic time during this video. Please remember to like and subscribe, I really hope YouTube is doing the little flashy thing right now. I've seen it happen to me, I hope somebody does it on... I hope it happens on my YouTube video. As you can see, it's boiling hot. I've got my fans off right now. It's 32 degrees in my, in my house right now. So please like and subscribe. Give me a nice follow. Give me a comment, please, down below. Tell me what you thought of the game. And as always, I love you more than the next one. And I love you more than the previous one. Please stay and be, be healthy, guys. Oof, I, man, I've got to go get like fans. Oh, it's hot.